tonight, we will start with chapter 2 of the Gospel according to John. How many of you have been blessed by what's been preached and taught these last few weeks? Well, you're in for another blessing. We will be diving deep into the Word of God again tonight. Hopefully, you picked up tonight's outline from the vestibule before you came into the sanctuary. We will start with Pastor Julie Coleman covering Revelation 1, Creative Power, followed by Pastor Richard Foster covering Revelation 2, Jesus is Supreme over God's house. Pastor Dana Coleman will wrap up chapter 2 with Revelation 3, Jesus knows all men. Are you ready? God bless and amen. Good evening. So tonight we're going to start with John 2, 1 through 11. And while we're going there, I'll tell you about a little story about this traveler who was coming from Mexico. He was going through U.S. Customs, and he had with him this half-gallon jug of, like, it looked like water. And the inspector said, what is that? And he said, oh, it's, it's holy water from a, a shrine I was visiting. The inspector looked at him, unscrewed it, sniffed. He goes, it's tequila. The traveler said, good heavens, another miracle. <laughs> well, tonight we're going to hear about a real miracle. Amen. Jesus' first miracle. Amen. The creative power, John 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were set, there are six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then he sets the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This was the first miracle Jesus performed. And it revealed his, the creative power of God. Jesus demonstrated that he had the power to create and produce man, and to meet man's need. Verse 1 and 2 talks about how the marriage was in the Cana, was in Cana of Galilee. So let's recap what a Jewish wedding was like at that time. The first day there was the marriage and a big feast. So the ceremony and feast were uh, held on the same evening. Then the couple was escorted through town, kind of like what we're doing with our graduates in, in quarantine right now, right? They're going through town, and, and everybody in the community is coming out and celebrating them. So it was a, you know, that's a, that's a very old tradition to celebrate. But after that, they had an open house, a week-long open house. Now we know Mary. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples. You see, Jesus wasn't too busy to be sociable. I say again, Jesus wasn't too busy to be sociable. It's most likely that Joseph had passed away by this time because he wasn't mentioned. Now, the wedding was held in Cana, which is a small remote town. They think it's probably in the highlands of Galilee. I love that this happened in a little small village. I grew up in a small rural village, literally called a village. And, you know, the sense of community and the quietness is a very special thing. Verse 3 through 5 talks about the concern 
of Jesus' creative power. First, there was Mary's social concern. So we have this huge celebration, and it's still early in the week, and they ran out of wine. Now, remember, wine wasn't, you know, a party beverage for them. Couldn't get good water, and so they often drank, um, you know, diluted wine. This wasn't like us in the second week of quarantine. This was their actual, it was a drinking substitute. I know what you were doing. It was a critical need for them. And Mary likely, scholars think, wasn't just a guest, or she wouldn't have been so concerned. So many scholars think she, maybe she was the host, uh, one of the hostesses for this event, given that she felt uh, like she had to fi help find a solution. Now, I remember when one of my boys was about five, and he said to me, woman, feed me. <laughs> so we explained to him how oh, that's not really a good, nice way to address your mother. Now, this wasn't when calling someone woman 2,000 years ago wasn't, uh, wasn't as, as impolite as it is today. Uh, it's actually a, a polite way, a firm but polite way to address someone 2,000 years ago. And Jesus needed to address his mother. He wanted to know why was she getting him involved in the matter. And it was also Jesus telling Mary that he wasn't obligated to do anything she asks unless it's God's will. And here's also where John introduces the idea of the hour. So Jesus wasn't living on the wedding's timetable or Mary's timetable. He's living on a heavenly schedule set by his father. And Jesus was thinking about a deeper concern. He wasn't thinking about the social concern. He was worried about man's spiritual need. Now we also see here that Mary had great confidence in her son. So Jesus gently but firmly was telling his mother woman She's not obligated, he's not obligated to do what she asks. And Mary gets it. She doesn't argue with him. She doesn't say, I told you. She gets it. She has complete confidence in him. Now, keep in mind, Jesus hadn't performed a miracle yet. So it's, it's highly unlikely that she was expecting Jesus to perform a miracle. She was probably expecting him to go downtown and have the, one of the merchants reopen their stores and get some wine. So, but Ju Jesus saw an opportunity to show his creative power. And verses 6 through 8 talk about the revelation of Jesus' creative power. The materials, water pots, what were they used for? Cleaning and quenching thirst. So those are both physical and spiritual things for us. He gave the command, prepare. He simply instructed that preparations made. And when they obeyed, everyone experienced his creative power. And they were satisfied. They drew water and experienced the creative power of Jesus. We have to obey his instructions if we wish to be cleansed and created spiritually new. John 14, 21 says, He who has my commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verses 9 through 11 talk about the results of Jesus' power. Man's needs were met. Christ's glory was revealed. Now, John calls this a sign. A sign is more than that. So it points to something that we can't see necessarily. It points to his divine nature. And the faith of the disciples was strengthened. Now, we need to balance the writings of John. When I was a kid, when I read, the, uh, read like a history, right? But it's more than that. It's his story. So it's both history and Christ's story. There are several things we can take away from this uh, and again, when I was growing up, I, I just knew the story. Like, oh, wow, Jesus did his first miracle. Wasn't that awesome? But there's so many more points to this story. Yeah. Here's a few takeaways. Number one, wine is a symbol of joy. We can have joy in this world, but eventually it'll run out. Only Jesus can give new and ever-satisfying joy. 
The first miracle that God um, had Moses conduct was the plague. That, and he turned the, uh, the water into blood. That's showing judgment. Jesus' first miracle speaks of grace. How powerful is that? Here's another point. It's significant that only the servants knew the source of the wine. You'll see that later in John 4, the servants, uh, only servants were with, with Jesus when he healed the nobleman's son. We are also servants of Jesus. We can see what he's doing. We just have to pay attention. Fourth thing, Jesus took a problem and made it an opportunity. How many times do we complain about our problems when they're really opportunities? Jesus' interaction with Mary reminds us that when we go to God in prayer, we have to understand his will. Our will has to line up with his. Now, note what Mary did not say. She didn't go to him with a solution. There's no way she would have come up with that miracle as a solution. No way. So how often do we tell God, we need this, this, this? It's the solution. How much more would our blessings be if we just told God the problem? I don't know how you want to take care of it, God. I know you've got me. And see what he can do for you. And the last thing is, if Jesus could change water into wine, think about what he can do for you. Jesus was born in a manger, a humble and quiet beginning. The beginning of his miracles were done in a quiet village, someone else's celebration. He didn't choose his first miracle to be some big, spectacular thing in, a big, in front of a large crowd. He chose a simple act to manifest his glory. A simple act to show his sincerity and his compassion to those closest to him. And by doing so, he revealed his glory and he strengthened the foundation of their faith. Let his glory strengthen the foundation of your faith. Amen. I'll pick up where Pastor Julie left off in the scriptures. My text is John 2, 12 through 22. And as she's already said, Jesus is supreme over God's house. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. And they didn't stay there many days. Did not stay there many days. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. When his disciples remembered that, it was written, Zeal of your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us or show to us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Let me start out by saying this. Capernaum was now, I believe, Jesus' headquarters. But Capernaum was not only Jesus' headquarters. It was also where more miracles were done than any other city. 
Jesus didn't stay there long, and he moves on into Jerusalem. And there he drives out of the temple the ones who were only interested in making money. Now, having said that, let's go back to the first verse of my text, John tw uh, 2 and 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay many days. Notice here that Joseph's name was not mentioned. I believe, if I did my study right, he was already dead by this time. And as the oldest son, Jesus was now the head of the family. And I believe that's why his mother, his brothers occupied him or accompanied him. He supported them and they traveled with him at this time. You know, Jesus traveled with a large group. Remember at one time he sent out 70. There were more than the 12 disciples, but the 12 disciples were his inner group that he trained and worked with. They were his friends, which would be entrusted with the mission of building his church. In verse 12, the after this, I believe probably refers to the time that his hometown of Nazareth uh, would not receive him. When he went into the synagogue and read from Isaiah, and he said, and they said, is not this Joseph's son? Luke 4, 22. They would have killed him, but it was not yet his time. He walked out of Nazareth, took his family and disciples to Capernaum. And I believe this would be, would now become his headquarters for the remainder of his ministry uh, on earth. I'd like to also point out right here that his own brothers did not believe him at this time. John 7, 5 says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. They may have thought he was just carried away with some kind of religious enthusiasm or something. But later they would believe, and one of his brothers, James, would become the head of the church in Jerusalem. And as I said earlier, Capernaum was not only his headquarters, but it also was where miracles were performed, more miracles were performed than in any other city. Jesus would later comment about this and rebuke the people that lived there for their unbelief. <clears throat> they should have believed in him because he spoke in all their synagogues and he did more miracles there than anywhere. Now we get into verse 13, the cleansing of the temple. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now we all know that Jesus began his ministry in Cana as we just heard from Pastor Julie. Cana of Galilee, then he went to Capernaum, and now he's in Jerusalem. Notice, too, that John labels the feast of the Passover as the Jews' Passover. This is no longer the Lord's Passover. It has now become a merely a religious feast, quite meaningless, I guess, just a ritual to go through. One of, uh, the one of the, whom the Passover speaks is, has now come. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Jesus has now gone up to Jerusalem. Why? Because he keeps the law. He obeys the law. The law requires that all males go to Jerusalem three times a year. At the time of the Feast of the Passover, at the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles, and time of the Feast of Pentecost. I figured uh, this was about mid-April at this time when he was going to Jerusalem. And now we get to the cleansing of the temple. I believe if I studied this right, he did this on two occasions. One at the beginning of his ministry and a second time near the end of his ministry. Verse 14 says, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. They were selling animals and doves and they were exchanging money, all for a profit, of course. In the name of the Lord. The money exchangers performed a service for the worshipers. The money that could be offered, the only money that could be offered in the temple was temple money or Jewish money. So the money changers had a booth set up, I guess in the foyer or out there somewhere, where the Roman coins, for example, were exchanged for Jewish coins. The reason for not allowing Roman coins was because they had an effigy of Caesar on them. Now the money changers made a good profit when they exchanged their money. 
something like 40 to 50 percent. Like if you wanted to exchange five dollars, they'd give you three and they would keep two for themselves. All of this in the name of the Lord. As I said earlier, that this was a service for the worshiper, and it was. But it was also made religion easy. Religion, I said. They changed large coins into small ones for the convenience of the worshiper. I was going to tell a story about the $20 bill, but I forego that. But they also made religion cheap. They also sold animals, and it was a lot of work to raise the animals, and people got paid for doing that. It was very easy for all of them to become, for this to become a religious racket. There may be things going on like that in some churches today. I don't know. I'm just saying. Verses 15 through 17, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. Now I believe, and this is my opinion, that Jesus was not a wimp. I don't believe that Jesus was an anemic-looking Christ that many artists portray him to be. I believe he was not a pushover. I believe he was a man's man, if you will. I don't have any basis for this. It's just my opinion. But you don't go waltzing into a place like the, a temple uh, and scourge everyone out of there without any resistance if you're a wimp. You know, this was a very powerful expression of the deity of Jesus Christ. There would have been some sort of resistance from a crowd this size, probably in the thousands of people gathered there for the feast of the Passover. There would have probably have been some resistance from the temple police, which would have numbered over 100, I'm sure, who were there to keep the peace in the gathering of this size. Anyway, there was no resistance in Jesus. One man drove them out with a whip made of cords, not an AK-47. Okay, moving right along, enough of my opinions. These verses tell us that the disciples remembered Psalm 69, 9. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you, know, do you show us uh, since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it in three days? Raise it up in three days? At this time, the temple was Herod's temple. It had been under construction for some 46 years and was still not finished. The Jews thought that Jesus was talking about the temple, the building, but he was talking about his own body. They challenged his statement because it seemed impossible to them that anyone could rebuild the temple in three days. They did not know that Jesus was referring to his death and resurrection at this time. When he was on trial for his life, though, his enemies brought this incident back up that he said, and he could rebuild the temple in three days. Verse 21 tells us plainly that he was speaking of the temple of his body. The Jews did not know that he was talking about his body, and neither did his disciples. It was not until after his resurrection that the disciples would remember what he said and would understand that he meant his body. And in closing, the final verse of my portion of John 2, verse 22, Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. My friends, let me tell you, Jesus is supreme over God's house. Amen. Amen, amen. I will continue... Where Pastor Richard left off, we are still in John 2. 
I will start at verse 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. In the last few verses, we see some momentum in Jesus' ministry. He is traveling quite a bit at this point in this chapter. He was now in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And we're all aware that he was at the point where he was really starting to fulfill scripture. By now, he, was, he has chosen his disciples. He has performed his first miracle, turning water into wine, as Julie, Pastor Julie uh, shared with us. He turned over tables in the temple. Wow. I could only imagine what that scene looked like. Could you imagine if we had media back then? That definitely would have been a sight to see. But he was moving at, ex at an accelerated speed because he needed to accomplish what had been prophesied in the Old Testament. His timeline, of course, was the will of the Father, but it was all a bridge from the prophecies of the Word of God in the Old Testament. But more particularly, his ministry that will bring him to a place of death and open the door for us to experience eternal life. Amen? Jesus the Christ was the most unique and one-of-a-kind person in all of history. His life was so important and pivotal to mankind that history actually divided his life, B.C. and A.D., by virtue of his birth as a man, Jesus Christ is now both son of God and son of man. He is deity and he is humanity. Jesus is the God man. In verse 23, we see point number one that many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Verse 23. In this verse, we begin to see the separating of opinions among the people. We see the group of people here that believed only in his name as a result of the signs in which he did. Jesus began to really make a name or what we would call today a brand for himself. And people began to believe in his name even though they didn't actually personally know him. They didn't necessarily believe that he was God, but they believed what they saw and they associated what they saw to his name. Now, there's a brand name called Coleman. Yes. And Coleman makes outdoor camping gear and equipment and those types of products. Their products are top of the line, four star, five star, four diamond, whatever you want to call it. All I know is that every Father's Day, Memorial Day, July 4th, and Labor Day, people flood to the online stores and Dick's Sporting Goods to buy grills, to buy beach canopies, and camping supplies made by the Coleman name. The people that purchase the products don't actually know Mr. Coleman. They may not even know his first name. They don't know the quality of his character nor his net worth. But they believe and have faith in the products that his brand name provides. They believe because they saw with their own eyes that Coleman products really do work. 
The Bible tells us that the spectators in these verses believed in Jesus' name because of the signs that he performed, but the Bible never said that they believed in Jesus Christ as the deity and the son of the living God. They believed that he could heal the sick because they saw it. They believed that he could turn water into wine because they saw it. They believed that he could heal the lame man and that he can make the blind man see because they saw it. They believed in his works. They believed it and they even believed in what he could do for them. If he could do it for him, if he could heal his eyes, if he could make him walk, then he must be Jesus Christ. This is what I call the new car, new house faith. This is the one that says, oh, she must know God because she has a new car. Or, oh, he must know God because he bought a new house. But this is not the type of faith that Jesus Christ requires from his true disciples. In fact, they didn't quite know the God man any more than anybody who purchased Coleman knew Mr. Coleman. Here we see a divide of genuine faith versus inadequate faith. We see a difference between genuine faith and inadequate faith. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 reminds us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because we told our Bibles on Sunday mornings and wear our big, beautiful caps and we wear our high heels and our and our dresses all the way down to the floor, and we gallivant back and forth does not mean that we will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because we see the Christ healing the sick and raising the dead, it doesn't mean that we will be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Just because my grandmother prayed for me and my uncle prayed for me and my mama prayed for me doesn't mean that I get a free ticket to heaven. Many believed in the fame and the fortune and the flair and the signs that they saw. They were focused on the miracle and not the miracle worker. They were focused on the man and not the Messiah. They were focused on the signs and neglected the savior, savior that stood right before them. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs, which he did. Point number two. That takes us to verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Jesus would not commit himself. Let's look at, look at this word, to commit. When you commit, you pledge or bind yourself to a certain course. Let me say that again. When you commit, you pledge or bind yourself to a certain course course. Yes, Jesus would later be turned over and be punished for man's transgressions, but there is one place alone in scripture where Jesus mentions committing himself to another. One place where he was willing to pledge and bind himself to a certain course. Luke 23, 46 says, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. I can remember when my husband and I went to premarital counseling. And my parents are pastors and they did our premarital counseling. And everything was going well. He was broke. I was broke. We knew it. His credit was bad. My credit was bad. We knew it. We, we both knew all the bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
But one night we had to meet with my parents, our pastors, and my father said out of his mouth, Dana Denise, you know that after you walk down that aisle and you commit yourself to Lamar Coleman, that I will no longer be responsible for you. And I said, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that the man that I've known almost all my life, I'm about to trade him in for a man who I just met eight months ago. Barely know his middle name. I cried all the way down the aisle. I struggled because I did not want to leave my father. My father was my everything. He did everything for me. He came out in the middle of the night when I was coming from the club. I was wrong as all outdoors. He came all the way out to fix my tire on the side of the road. That was my dad. Even when I was wrong, he gave me extra lunch money when I went to school. He gave me extra this and slid me extra that. Even when my mom said, you know what, Dana, you 18, it's time for you to grow up and move out of this house. Because we can't have two queens up in here. My father took me to get my keys for my first apartment. And do you know that we sat in that car and he said, I know that you just got some new keys. But you can keep the keys to the house. Take the key. Don't even give me the keys back. You always welcome in my door. That's the kind of father I had. So when we look at the word of being able to commit, he wasn't willing to commit himself to man. Why wasn't he willing to commit himself to men? Well, the Bible says that he knew all men. There was no man that could hide from the eyes of God. What did, G, what did God say in the Garden of Eden? Adam, where are you? We don't really think that he didn't know where Adam was. He knew exactly where Adam was. There's nowhere that men can go that we will not know, be known by God, Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And for everybody who is a Bible scholar in here who wants to say, well, that was God who said that. Let's go down memory lane. In John 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The word was God. John also wrote in John 1 and 14, he said, the word became flesh, that sounds like Jesus Christ to me, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the book of Revelations, it says, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. That's Revelations 9, 13. And Jesus said out of his own mouth in John 10 and 30, I and my Father are one. So Jesus said, Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Jesus has an intimate knowledge of his creation. In fact, the Bible says in Luke 12 and 7 that the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Saints, he knew all men. In our nature to simply file, out, file up the simplest of tasks, in our depravity, tendencies toward evil desires of the flesh, he knew all men in our deception and in our fickleness. In our one day I want to go to this church and the next day I want to go to that church. One day I want to hear this person preach and the next day I want to hear that person preach. One day I like Pastor Wood but tomorrow I don't like Pastor Wood. Come on now, in our fickleness. He knew that our belief wasn't worth a hill of beans. 
He wasn't willing to pledge or bind himself to our wishy-washiness. He wasn't impressed by our shallow birdbath faith. Psalm 146 and 3 says, Do not put your trust in princes nor in man in whom there is no help. Hezekiah Walker said, Jesus is my help. He didn't say Keisha is my help. He didn't even say Tyrone is my help. So what we calling Tyrone for? We don't got to call Tyrone. All we have to do is get on our knees and call on Jesus Christ. For he is a faithful God. The Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and they that run to it, they are safe. He promised that all we have to do is call on his name. His name is dependable, and he will redeem you. Finally, point three, and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus doesn't need us to testify to who he is. He is the sovereign God. He is the God of gods and the King of kings and the Lord of us. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He has all knowledge. Listen, he doesn't need our help. He is the wheel in the middle of the wheel. He is the great I am. Angels and the elders and the cherubs, they are around the throne saying glory, 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 and holy, holy, holy. And they are worshiping him. And he doesn't need us to testify of him. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 7 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That means he don't need our testimony. He is the testimony. For he knew what was in man. I remember in 1 Samuel when they were trying to choose the next king of Israel and all of the sons sashayed across Samuel and Samuel just knew that all of these other big and buff guys were the ones. But Jesus in um, 1 Samuel 16, 7 said, don't look at his outward appearance and his physical stature because I have refused him. Mm. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He has infrared vision. He has perfect vision. Psalm 139 says he has perfect vision so much so that he said, for you form my inward parts. He didn't just deal with the outside. You know, we try to focus on the outside of our beings. We try to focus on who we are on the outside. We dress ourselves up, but on the inside, we a mess. You know, the Bible says he formed our inward parts and he covered us in our mother's womb. Verse 15 says, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret, there's no secret to God. He said, and I was skillfully wrought in the Lord as parts of the earth. He knows my name. Mm. He knows everything about me. He knows that the heart is deceitful. Mm. Above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? God said, I know it. He said, I, the Lord, search the heart and I testify and I test the mind. And finally, Matthew 15 and 8, these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. Saints, he knows. And they showed us at the very beginning of John that he knew that he would be, be betrayed. He knew that we would deny him our faith under pressure. He knows that we will forsake him and we will turn away and we will say that we love him one day and, and we would do something different the next. He knew that we would slip and fall over and over again. Jesus knew all of these things, but he still loved us. What a mighty God we serve. In a lifetime, we can never fully know Jesus Christ, but he knows us. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he still loves us. 
he still calls our name. There's a song that says, how many times do I go against your will, yet you forgive me and you keep calling my name. The word of the Lord has been rich thus far, and we are so grateful for all that was shared here on chapter 2 tonight. We pray that it was a blessing to each and every person that came into this place. And we pray that you will continue to come every Wednesday night to be able to be a part of everything that is coming forth. Amen? Amen. Amen.